thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and Madam President, Toastmasters of the evening, Toastmasters all. Uh, this is uh, an interesting topic, and basically what the premise is, is that music, the arts, and generally the, the, the piano has been a platform, a leading indicator and a catalyst towards social change. So let's uh, begin our journey. Um, I will not be politically correct this evening. I will basically state the facts, even if they are not trendy, okay? And I promise to be epical and not lyrical. In other words, everything I say is based on the research I've done, even though it may not fit in with what the, the times stipulate. I will also try not to bore you. So uh, lend me your ears and please uh, be patient. So first of all, I'd like to state that anything I state about pianists or the piano is taken from a great book, one from uh, Harold Schoenberg, who was also uh, the New York Times music critic for a lot of years. Okay, it's a great book. If ever you wanna learn more about what's going on in the music industry and specifically uh, in the piano domains, this is the book to read. In addition, much to my surprise, I thought that I was gonna be innovative, but it turns out that indeed a lot of research has been done regarding the social impacts of music. And this is one great piece of work that I basically will reference to uh, during my uh, my presentation today. And surprise, surprise, that all started with Plato when he basically said that music actually does influence our behavior. It's all here. Um, if anything, if I deviate from these things, I'll let you know. What is a leading indicator? A leading indicator in economics is nothing more than something, some production criteria that gives us an idea of where the economy is going. So for example, in Greece, a leading indicator is construction. If you see the construction has started taking place, this means that uh, the economy is on the way up. To say in the US, car manufacturing would be a leading indicator. And what is an etude? An etude in music is a study. It's a piece that has been written so that someone can study the instrument of their choice, okay? Now, what qualifications do I have to do this presentation? Well, believe it or not, I do have some qualifications. First and foremost, I was actually studying to be a concert pianist, and I am very articulated with the instrument, but I'm also an instrument tuner, and uh, I do maintain pianos. That isn't my chief occupation. My chief occupation actually is engineering, as you know, and mostly mobile telephony. But this, these two aspects of my competence have, led, have also led me to being a schizophrenic maniac. Why? Because of the fact that there's always the Apollonian and the Dionysian aspect of my character fighting, okay? But you know, being a schizo is not a question of Tony. Anything that has to do with discrimination shows that this is a schizophrenic situation on behalf of the species, because discrimination is nothing more than a species not coming to terms with themselves. And what I am pl planning to show you right now is that music and piano, this great piece of engineering that harmonizes music, physics, and engineering also harmonizes our character and actually allows us to come into terms of who you are, with who we are, leaving behind any kind of brutal, if you want, uh, uh, brutal, provocative, and uh, outdated uh, behavior. Now, let's go back to the beginning, to the beginning after the Enlightenment, when people actually started paying attention to culture. And let's go, of course, where else? To Johann Sebastian Bach. Of course, during that time, close to his death of 1750, he was invited to come to Frederick the, Great, Frederick the Great's court and to present some of his works. Now, this is the first time that an enlightened monarch actually called to his court a composer. But an interesting aspect about Bach is his wife, Anna Maria Magdalena. She was also a composer, and not only a composer, but she was well-versed in contrapuntal uh, composition. So she actually used to finish some of Bach's work. And she also made a study, but she was never invited to court. We had to wait a couple hundred years for that. Until who? Mozart's sister. Mozart's sister, which we don't hear about, was actually a court musician and the very first concert, if you want, 
pianist and she was invited to court. Now, of course, when someone is invited to court, one has the ear of the people at court and thus slowly begins social change. And if we actually continue, in this trend, all of this is documented in, Schoen in Schoenberg's book, uh, The Great Pianist, by the way, it's all there. So I don't, I'm not referring to it uh, because I'm basically taking the information from there. Now, uh, and as well as some other things that I'd like to mention before we go to the concert piano is that aside from being part of a woman's dowry uh, as a, a part of her expression, uh, the concert piano actually became a career and a very influential career. Now, during the 18th and 19th centuries, concert pianists were like rock stars. You know, for example, Liszt, which is uh, the picture on the top, uh, was so popular that aristocrats or the women used to throw their jewels at him and some other things. On the other hand, we have the very first modern concert pianist in the form of Clara Schumann, which is below Robert Schumann's wife. She was a superstar. Okay, it was the royalty that actually went to see her. She did not go see royalty. And as the instrument started to gain status, we also had actual engineers marrying concert pianists so they could actually elevate their status. So Schiller, the guy that designed the University of Athens here in Greece, etc., married Ms. Vidotu, who was a concert pianist. Of course, it was love, but it was also steps. Of course, let me say something that as we came into the 20th century, um, the piano became also the form of social change in other aspects, that of racial equality. At the time, way before a particular great man had a dream, we had a Duke, Duke Ellington, being driven in a limousine and being greeted by presidents. And that, of course, started tempering people's hearts to what actually should be the way of the future way after the American Revolution and way before the uh, social changes that were brought in by uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King. Um, let me, sorry, there we go. Okay, and coming up to the 20th century again, we had the Cold War and guess what? Uh, one of the greatest concert pianists ever to walk this planet, Van Cliburn in 1958, won the Tchaikovsky competition, bringing closer Russia and the United States. And there you see Chairman Khrushchev giving Van Kleiberg the award. A lot of people ask Khrushchev, should we give it to him? He's an American. Khrushchev asked, was he the best? The committee said, yes. Well, by all means, give it to him. Okay. Continuing, we're in the 20th century and everyone that has something to say about status sits next to a piano. Some of us little, some of us well-known, as you can see. And in addition to that, I should mention, since we do live in Greece, that the greatest female pianist of the 20th century, again in Schoenberg's book, but admitted by all, is our very own Gina Bakauer, born in Greece and raised and trained in Greece. We do have a festival for her. It's not in Greece, of course. It's in the United States, in Utah. And of course, one of the things about the piano is you don't adapt yourself to the instrument, but you adapt the instrument to your ambience. It's not like a work environment where equality is fine, but of course you have to adapt yourself to the work, which is usually designed for a particular gender and hasn't changed. In music, the environment is you. This is the great Martha Argerich. No one can doubt the fact that the environment and the ambience that she portrays is 100% Martha. And some other, we have Wuja Wang, as you can see. We have Harry Truman playing with uh, Loren Bacall on the piano. And to the right, I know a lot of you love this guy, Anthony Hopkins. Hmm? That's what it's all about. And just going back, because we do have piano technicians supporting this instrument, there is no room for any kind of segregation, discrimination, what you might call it. You can be blind. You can be anything you want. As long as you know what you're doing, you'll have a job. And maybe one day the drums of war will cease so that the hammers of chords will basically show that we are as a species coming to terms with ourselves. Now you may say like my former girlfriend, well, what are you talking about? Music is not machine guns. It's not refrigerators. I mean, it's not, it has nothing to do with production. How can that bring social change? Okay, there's a reason she's my former girlfriend. Well, if you go to this book, The Human Zoo, Mr. Desmond Morris, a zoologist says that we are a species that works 
so that we can play. The minute we as a species stop being creative, imaginative, stop researching, then we are done with, it's time to move over and pass the gavel to another species. Okay, thank you very, very much for your ears. God bless you all and may you always be in harmony with the heavens. Back to you, Toastmasters of the night. So Tony, a very interesting topic. I think the two parameters of it being thoroughly researched, tick, was a well-structured, a big tick. What I also really liked was the transitions were quite smooth. But given the fact that the topic was slightly unusual, I really liked the fact that you came and explained it quite early on as to what the premise is and the social impact of music which for me as an audience, I found it very interesting and very informative. Now let's talk about the bits in the middle, the engaging bits that I really liked. And I've got them on a piece of paper so I don't miss on anything. I think the first thing that really enthralled me as an audience was there were a lot of new facts. And you talked about Bach's wife and Mozart's sister and Clara Schumann. I didn't know about these ladies and their own music. So I think it gave me goosebumps to learn about it. And I, I was massively um, engaged with that. I really liked the tiny little surprise you gave us with the fusion of engineering and you being uh, and, and your story with the piano. I think that was a quick brief insight and I didn't know that about you. So that was a, that was a surprise element for me. What I also liked was how you connected pianists from the 18th and the 20th century as you were covering the transitions with the word rock stars. Because rock stars is a word that everyone relates to and we understand what that means. So that was, quite a good and a surprise element for me. And the fourth thing, which absolutely stood out completely were the images, Tony. I think there were so many images as you went through and as an audience who doesn't understand or know anything about the topic, it is a very good way to connect with the audience. It's a very good way to convey your message. And I really appreciated that. And <laughs> I like the funny elements where you asked us all to be patient with a girl sleeping on a piano and you talked about your ex-girlfriend. So, so that was good. The only two words Tony I'd say is uh, perhaps a bit of pausing could help because there was a lot to take in. And that kind of transitions me into the second point, which is that I, I probably thought that the presentation in itself was slightly content heavy. There was a lot going on. And maybe if we, if we reduce the content um, heaviness, it could be easier for us to consume as an audience. But overall, a very engaging and a very enthralling speech. So well done, Tony. I really enjoyed listening to it. Mm -hmm.